It's Thursday, June 11th, the Thursday before E3, but nobody told the folks at Oculus uh, who decided to hold their own little press conference today. And Peter Brown, you were there. I just got back. You just got back. What, just down the road? Yeah, not too far. I'm freaking pumped, man. Yeah? Yeah. Like, feeling good about like it? We were all there, though, because it they also streamed it. Yes. <laughs> they did. It was on the front page of Twitch, and uh, basically everyone in the office was tuned in, uh, watching Palmer Lucky do his bit. Yes. Uh, you have been reporting on VR for a long, long time. You've been you you've seen more demos than anyone else I know at GameSpot. What was your takeaway from what they showed today? So the hardware itself hasn't evolved terribly since the last iteration that we've seen, but it's the design has been refined. And, mm. and a lot of what they're talking about right now is the ergonomics and how it sits on your head, which is very important. Um, but the other aspects are the software, the games, how you control it, how you move in space. They seem to have answers and solutions for all of this. It's very exciting. People do need to understand that this is still just the beginning. Mm. You know? So the, the stuff we're going to see way is not going to be the be-all, end-all of VR. But it's an incredible step forward, and seeing games like Eve Valkyrie, which I've tried a couple years ago, like almost here, you know, and I'm almost going to be able to have my own Rift at home. I'm I'm really really excited for that. So okay. what what they were showing off today was the consumer model. Yes, is that right? Yes. Uh, so Justin, what do you think the big sort of key things they need to achieve with this consumer model uh, are? What do you think they need to like sell it on? Because well, it's such a difficult sell. The the big thing that they showed at the presentation was games. Like this was almost an E3 conference. Yeah. Like so, it, it's kind of the the timing is weird. They could have done this during E3, and there was that big focus on games, and that's what you need. Well, the problem is that I don't feel like all of the games that they showed were indicative of that VR experience. E Valkyrie, of course, is amazing. Mm. Like, that always yeah. looks great. We also saw a new game from Ted Price's studio, the Insomniac Games, which, oh, this looks interesting. This looks neat. I, why is that a VR game, though? Because we're watching this third-person adventure? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that is a problem, right? I mean, VR is supposed to mimic reality. Reality is a first-person experience. Mm. So while it's really exciting to see people like Ted Price come on stage and some of the other demos that were there... I do wonder if that is going to misrepresent or maybe harm people's initial impression when they try VR. Because I don't have a good impression of how this game is better in VR than it would be just yeah. on its own. Interesting to see him up there. Obviously, indies have been uh, the, the developers who have latched onto this mm -hmm. the most. There's this $10 million indie fund that Oculus are going to um, push out there. There was a bunch more indie games that were shown. Some were more um, impressive than others. But maybe the partnership that sort of had the most weight was uh, when Phil Spencer decided to turn up on stage. That is a huge deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not terribly surprising, but I don't know that we anyone saw it coming. Mm. Obviously, Sony has the Morpheus on the way. Microsoft needed an answer to that. We've seen their Arc headset, which is more of an augmented reality thing. Mm. So them embracing Oculus, you know, they already have their relationship on the PC side. DirectX 12 has a lot of features built into it that will help latency and rendering for VR. Uh, so I think it's a very smart move on behalf of both Oculus and Microsoft to partner so that you can stream Xbox One games to the Rift headset. Mm. You don't need to go buy an expensive PC. Uh, I mean, you can already do it with your phone, but I think a lot of us want this for games. And if you have an Xbox One, you're good to go with the Rift, yeah. basically. Yeah. Who knows when the HoloLens is going to come out. Right. Mm. Oh, yeah, the, the HoloLens, not the Arc. Um, but the one thing there, though, is that, you know, you're streaming games from your Xbox One to the headset, but you're not streaming virtual reality games. Yeah. What you're streaming is the experience of playing a game on a TV. So the demo they showed was you sitting in a room that looks like a living room, and there's a big screen TV on the wall mm. behind it. Uh, the image that you're seeing on that screen is 2D like it would be on any TV in real life. But the flexibility it provides in terms of being able to play anywhere in your house and feel like you're in the comfort of your own living room, mm. potentially, that's the promise they're making. And that's, that's pretty cool. I'll be interesting to see, interested to see if they do develop and announce VR experiences mm. that are the true stereoscopic 3D motion tracked thing that people will be looking for on PC. It's, I guess with Sony basically jumping in uh, full force with Morpheus, yeah. people making games for the Morpheus, it is almost a shame that the Xbox One doesn't have a like for like. Uh, do you think this could be something they show off at E3, Justin? Well, I mean, we're going to see a lot of Morpheus at E3. Are we going to see more? We're, and we're going to see Oculus. They, they've talked about that, like mm -hmm. actually getting to demo these things. Are mm. we going to see uh, VR experiences on the Xbox One there? I, I don't think so. And, and is it really that big yet? Like, I know that we're excited for it, but I mean, just think about the, the PlayStation Move controllers. Mm. Anytime you have an aftermarket accessory, and this is something we've said over and over again, when after the console's out and you're introducing a secondary form of communication with that console, like Morpheus, like the PlayStation Move controllers, 
that's not going to catch on as big. Like you, you're trying to get people who already have a console, millions of people already have it. Mm. Are they going to invest more money or pay more money for a console with this thing as an add-on? Probably not. I think that there is a point to be brought up, though, is that you're not just buying it for the Xbox, where the move is proprietary to PlayStation. Yeah. The, the, the Rift will work with the PC if you have it. You know, I mean, there are applications that go beyond the console and way beyond gaming as well. Like, we don't need to get into that right now, but this is something that has mass market appeal. It's, it's going to be targeted at enthusiasts, especially gamers off, mm. off the, the start, but uh, I would not be shocked to see people picking this up. You know, parents, like, for their kids, they want it, but there's also going to be the promise of stuff for them if they don't play games. Yeah. So I, I hope that the same problem doesn't exist. Well, one of the pe- biggest problems forever has been uh, the price point, the justification of spending $300 or however much this is going to cost in Q1 of 2016 on a new piece of hardware. If you're eyeing up the Morpheus and you're like, oh, I can use this on my PlayStation, and then suddenly the Oculus is actually deployable on a bunch of different systems, it certainly makes it a much more appealing uh, uh, price point. And the fact that we took Connect or Microsoft took Connect out of the Xbox, both to lower the price, and because that's not a super popular piece of hardware. There's not a lot you can do with it. I mean, you have to have the killer app. We've said that over and over again as well. There has to be a killer app Mm. with VR, and there has to be a lot of reasons to get it. It can't, even just one game, that's going to be enough to get the hardcore, to get that broad audience. You have to have a lot of stuff. And it's going to be outside gaming. I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of the interesting things uh, that I really appreciated, maybe as somebody who's not uh, fully sort of divin- uh, dove into Oculus properly, was the, the software hub that they have mm-hmm. uh, for the unit where you can basically go in and not only like sort of launch all your games from that platform, but also, interestingly, demo games. And not demo games via video, which is the main problem we're trying to sell VR things to people, is you need to sort of be in the experience. But yeah. there are like sort of almost like software demos for each of these, so you can sort of just look around and experience them. Yeah, we've already seen that um, in real life with the Samsung Gear VR. Samsung is making the displays for the Oculus mm. headsets, and they've also created a passive VR headset where you can take a Samsung Galaxy Note or an S6, plop it in there. You can buy that today, and it has a very similar platform to what you were just talking about. Mm with the demos, and there are so many things. It's not just games. There's film experiences. There's location experiences. Um, and those are really cool. Like they are. Getting to try those out, even as someone who's very, I'm still very skeptical of VR, being in this kind of filmic experience, exploring a, a scene around you, it's, yeah. it's a really immersive mm. way to experience film. And I'll be honest, you know, uh, pornography kind of plays <laughs> on, no, 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 let, let's be honest here. Pornography yeah. plays on our base <laughs> instincts. Yeah. And I've heard so many developers tell me that this exec only agreed to come on when I showed him a porn demo, right? Because not everyone wants to be a spaceship fighter, right? Yeah. But sex is a universal thing. Mm. That will probably be the thing you know, that drives this technology forward. I mean, the porn industry has legitimized so many different mm. technologies over the years. Um, and that is a sort of thing that really does, like again, play in your base instincts, and, it, and it's hard to not buy into it a little bit, at least in terms of the excitement of just like, yeah. what, like what is this, you know? it's. It has a universal appeal that a lot of uh, things uh, don't when, you, when right. you look at high technology like this. And maybe not the, the best segue into what was probably the biggest um, announcement, or at least the, uh, there's one more thing that Parma Lucky right. uh, uh, mentioned at the end, was that they do have a new input device uh, sort of coming on the heels of Valve uh, with their uh, uh, touch yeah, device. Yeah, they'll let you use it one-handed, which I think is very important. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, no, I mean, the, the input is very important. And mm. While it's great to see that they're including a gamepad, uh, there are in, li- uh, inherent limitations to that form factor. You have to keep your hands in a static position mm. on a device. And what the, the touch does is it allows you to move your hands independently. Uh, Valve's controller has like a, like a grip button that you can squeeze to activate things. I mean, that's something that we've not really done in gaming, but mm. something we do in real life. Say, opening a door, right? You, know, you squeeze that, that handle when you grab it. Um, I didn't see anything like that in this controller, but I also didn't get a chance to try it for myself. That's mm. going to happen at E3. Did you get to hold it at least? Did they have any no. of them that you could touch? I took photos, but they wouldn't let me touch. Um, that was no touching. No touching. Mm. No touching the touch. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, it's a it's a pretty good solution based on just what they presented. Um, Valve's is great, so I I have really high expectations when it comes mm. to this being as good or better than. Um, but it's certainly a better solution than they've demoed up until this point over the past three years. When I think about the VR experiences that I've really uh, sort of have stayed with me um, afterwards, when I tried the Morpheus, I used the PlayStation Move controllers. Yeah. I'm a big fan of the Move controllers, as it happens, but even in that situation, uh, I was able to like 
pick something up by, by pulling that right. little trigger. And that's like an incredibly basic form of what Valve are going for or yeah. what Oculus are, are going for her here. But another interesting thing about that, I think, is that the problem, we're used to an Xbox controller. We don't even look down when we're looking yeah. at the buttons. But if you hand it to somebody who doesn't know how to play those types of games, or even somebody who yeah. plays PlayStation games, you hand them an Xbox controller, it's, there's a barrier there. Whereas with these, a there's a bit more intuition. Yes, I mean, it, they're pretty limited in terms of the inputs per device. So obviously, you have the motion tracking. But when it comes to actually doing actions, you have a trigger on the back. You have an analog stick like you know device, and you mm -hmm. have just two buttons, right? I mean, two buttons is very easy for someone to understand. You move an inch here, an inch there. They're they're raised from the surface. They're tactile. Like, there you go. I think that will help uh, break down that barrier in terms of intimidation. And what do you think about the sensors with the fingers? Like, obviously, that's used for gestures, for instance, maybe for, for thumbs up, thumbs yeah. up, yeah. You radical dude. <laughs> it's basically like everything you can do in Surgeon Simulator now you can do in, in the Oculus. Well, clarify this for me because maybe I missed it, but were mm. they saying that it's going to track your fingers? Because I don't think that was part of it. Uh, what I thought he said was that there was a mesh, almost, of sensors there and that they could see individual fingers. Yeah, being like, if, oh, you, give it a, if yeah. you give it a thumbs up, it knows that you're doing that. If you're pointing, well, that's pretty exciting. it knows somehow that you're doing yeah. that. That's good. But you know, I mean, Tubular. I <laughs> there's also the promise of a device that goes away from any kind of traditional controller form factor. Um, Nintendo was kind of crazy with the power glove back in the day, mm. but even back then it showed the potential to be able to close your hand, move your fingers, and have the game detect what's happening there. So something like a power glove where you can, you know, literally move every finger and have that not hit with a sensor, mm. but have the sensors on each knuckle uh, that's going to be pretty important. And then you're not worrying about buttons or anything like that. And, but like the power glove, and, and again, the most important thing is that it works perfectly. Yeah. Like when the Kinect came out, yeah. it's like, oh, this is a really cool idea. It, uh, it doesn't actually work that great. Mm. If this comes out and it's like, this is actually that amazing experience, it's going to be a barrier to get people to understand, like, no, no, this is not the promise that we always get that doesn't actually pay out. This is really good. And we see a lot of people kind of speaking down about VR right now. I think that's the problem is that they're so focused on these early experiences as the be-all, end-all of VR when this is just the beginning. And you know, not to quote him, and that is what he said, but that really is the way this, mm. this is. Like, everything started somewhere, right? It wasn't until Miyamoto perfected jump physics that platformers became really popular, but someone did, right? And we've built off that. And so I see evidence of us succeeding in small areas, and that's just going to get better. Excellent. Exciting times. It certainly seems like we're definitely on the, the forefront of uh, something very special. And uh, especially today, looking at consumer models for the first time is um, uh, an exciting prospect. Uh, Q1 2016 is what they're saying. Q1 2016. Anything on price at all yet? Uh, in the past, they've said they want it to be at or below $300. Hmm. I'd, I'd certainly like it to be at or below $300. Yes, I'd be shocked if they went above that. I don't think you're going to get those touch controllers with yeah. it. That seems um, like a, an extra product. Uh, I think they've also said if you're getting like a good PC, along with this will be in a, the $1,200 price mm. range or will not cost more than $1,200. So like, if you have a decent gaming rig, you're probably already set up and mm. this will be maybe three, four hundred on top. But if you're not chasing the high-end gaming experience, you definitely do not need a PC that is that expensive. Yeah. There are so many things you can do with video uh, and uh, you know games that have very simple qualities to them but still communicate a great experience through the design mm. and so the use of VR. If you like indie games and porn, set. And Nailed it. Presumably, if you're looking for one of these, you probably already own a PC um, of a certain that certain speed. Anyway, uh, exciting stuff. Uh, we haven't even reached E3 yet, and already there's a bunch of uh, interesting announcements around VR, and uh, you can be sure that there will be a lot more in the coming days. So for all the latest news on virtual reality and everything else, video games at E3, stay tuned to GameSpot.com. We'll see you down in LA.